Hey everybody, it's Will here. Welcome back to another episode of the Blockware Intelligence YouTube channel. As always, we're going to be going over some key market trends from this week and stuff that you should keep in mind moving forward regarding the Bitcoin market. Before we start, I just wanted to mention that Blockware is actually creating an indicator dashboard. It should be launched in the next week or so. We'll include a lot of the metrics that we look at, A, in the newsletter um, and you know, on this YouTube channel, and also some of the stuff that I put out on Twitter uh, will be free. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully this is a, a resource that you guys can use to help, you know, get a good understanding of what's going on with the market. Uh, so keep a close look out for that. So this week we're on week 12. Feels kind of crazy that we've uh, been doing these for this long, looking at the week of uh, October 22nd to today, the, the 29th. Um, and by the way, this week we actually had a, another uh, guest writer, Nick Batia, uh, one of my good buddies who um, wrote an excellent book. Uh, called Layered Money. He covered some global macro um, and we'll, we'll scroll down and look at that after I go through the on-chain section. Be sure to, to check out the newsletter and, and you know read what he, what he put in there this week and, and check out his newsletter as well. And then in addition, of course, we have our Bitcoin-related equity section written by Blake Davis, which is always excellent. Uh, start just with some, some key price levels. Uh, we haven't changed these in weeks. Uh, we bounced pretty cleanly off of this 56, 58K uh, supplied zone, if you will. Um, obviously, we'd like to see this hold here. I'm just going to go ahead and read this off uh, what I wrote. On Wednesday, we saw another leverage flush out with a very similar setup to the one we discussed last week. This is the one we discussed last week. We saw open interest rising, particularly crypto margined contracts. So we're looking at futures contracts that are margin with crypto rather than stable coins or USD. We also had funding rising as Bitcoin, was, Bitcoin price was decreasing. Pairing those factors with some tight liquidation levels, which I like to look at high block for that, it's a great uh, platform. It wasn't surprising to see longs liquidated. Positive funding in itself is not always in an intermediate term bear sign as in a trending market that can just be the cost of doing business. Where funding has real signal, in my opinion, is when price is diverging from an aggressive move that it's making. It's all about putting it into context of other factors, guys. So as you'll see, funding was rising as price was decreasing here, and then that translated to a flush. Uh, similar dynamic here. Uh, and then, you know, obviously we had this big flush uh, from right after all-time highs. I tweeted right here. Um, so if you look right here, um, I, I'm, I didn't necessarily put this in just to show myself, guys. I'm just trying to say, like, you know, you can look at these dynamics um, and, and they can give some decent signal about what's going to, you know, un unravel. Um, so if you can see here, I said price price grinding down and funding is rising for your information. That was right here on this spike, guys. So you can also take an even more granular look at, by comparing funding rates amongst individual exchanges. Another factor that added to my conviction of there being a flush was the fact that more retail-driven exchanges such as Bybit and Binance had high funding, 55 to 70% APR. Meanwhile, exchanges such as Deribit and FTX had much lower funding. And that's what I was talking about here in this tweet. With the launch of the ProShares Bitcoin e Futures ETF, uh, ticker BITO, We've seen CME futures open interest soaring over the last couple of weeks. CME is now the leading futures exchange with open interest now over $4.7 billion, which is 77,090 BTC uh, in, in BTC terms. This must be kept in mind moving forward because when you're looking at measures such as market cap divided by open interest, uh, you're, you need to now take into account the fact that you know CME is such a large portion of that open interest, uh, meaning that there's there's uh, the reason I say that is that there's not as much leverage on CME compared to some of these other exchanges, such as you know Binance or Bybit or FTX. Another key uh, dynamic in, from the derivatives market, which I've been trying to push pretty hard lately, is the percent of open interest that's margined by crypto. This is important because as the metric rises, it means the futures market is prone to more convexity to the downside. If you're longing Bitcoin with Bitcoin collateral, it's great when price is rising. But as soon as the market starts to move against you, not only is your PL decreasing, but also the margin that you, you put in for that contract, uh, leaving your contract less collateralized as, as price goes against, you know, if, you, if you're long and price goes against your trade, uh, and you're, you're more susceptible to getting liquidated. If short and, and your margin with USD or stable coins, you're no longer, you, you no longer have that inadvertent hedge that you do when you're margin with Bitcoin or crypto. 
Um, so, you know, if you're short, right, and, and, and you're, you're betting on the market going down, but your margin with Bitcoin, even if the market starts going up and the trade's going against you, well, you're still, your collateral is increasing. So you kind of have this, that's what I'm saying, by inadvertent hedge. Seeing this metric continue to decline, as we can see since May, uh, means that there's less potential convexity on a down move and a higher likelihood of shorts being squeezed. Next up, we look at the entity adjusted version of our good old friend SOPR, aka spent output profit ratio. This looks at the value of all the Bitcoin trading on each given day based on the profit that they're realizing. We got our bullish confirmation last month right here, uh, but it now looks like we're starting to tick back down a bit again. So we want to either see a higher low, as we saw here, higher lows, um, you know, at the end of last year, or at least a minimum bounce off one again if we come back down and retest and have another price correction. Uh, but for now, there's nothing really to worry about. A few weeks ago, we mentioned that whales have been taking profits after, accumulated, uh, after accumulating since late July. Over the last two weeks, we've actually started to see them accumulate again. The green line, as you'll see right here, looks at all the entities that Glassnodes identified using their heuristics with more than 1,000 BTC. And then we filter out for known exchanges such as, I mean, I'm sorry, known entities such as exchanges. And then we apply a 14-day moving average to that. Um, so, you know, the reason I do that is because Glassnodes algorithms aren't necessarily perfect, right? Uh, they're, they're heuristic out, you know, that, that are doing all this uh, entity clustering. And so I don't think you can really take the actual value uh, and really do anything with it. I think you kind of take it with a grain of salt, right? Because it's not perfectly accurate. But I still do think, you know, that's why I applied the 14, uh, you know, simple day moving average is because, you know, I still do think that the trend of, of where whales holdings are going still has some signal to it. Um, and then in addition, uh, minnows, which is the blue line. Uh, so this is 0.1 to 1 BTC. Those entities have, have been stacking as always, um, you know, zooming out minnows holdings are just pretty much up and to the right of, of uh, you know, the chart throughout Bitcoin's history. This is really showing the relentless belief in the asset from uh, retailers that are DCAing around the world, aka okay, dollar cost averaging. Now we're going to move on to the macro picture, uh, not, not a global macro, but macro on-chain picture. Um, so I could only include two charts because of the, the email limits. Uh, there's, there's limits on, on uh, the newsletter. So especially when we have like a guest writer, uh, I'm kind of like picking through which charts I think are the most important to include. Uh, but on Wednesday, I put out a 22 tweet thread on this. Um, so if you want a more in-depth analysis, be sure to check this thread out. So first, we have the long-term holder supply shock ratio, which we've looked at several times before. This compares the amount of supply in possession of short-term holders versus long-term holders, and Glassnode uses a 155-day threshold to uh, separate between the two. Below, I inverse the chart and drew trend lines over the metric. I do think trend lines are just as valid in on-chain analysis as they are in technical analysis, because at the end of the day, we're all just visualizing human behavior. After retesting the lower trend line, aka long-term holders have locked up a record amount of supply, I would be looking to be cautious as the ratio would move back up to the upper trend line, as you can see. Next up, we have the entity adjusted rolling 90-day sum of coin days destroyed with a 90-day moving average over it. It's a mouthful, right? <laughs> as you can see, destruction in a broader sense is very low, especially when relative to where we are in terms of price. This paired with long-term holder supply, average spent output lifespan, dormancy, destruction, spent volume age bands, and HODL waves are all, this is just another way to, to show how strong HODLing behavior has been. So as you can see, um, destruction is pretty much at all-time lows when you're looking at the 90-day uh, the rolling sum and then throwing a 90-day moving average on that. And last but not least, we just take a peek at what's going on with miners. We've had seven straight positive difficulty adjustments in a row, which is just a reflection of how relentlessly hash has been coming back online. And with this, revenue per hash in Bitcoin terms continues to decline, but rising dollar prices of Bitcoin have kept revenue per hash in, in dollar terms at levels comparable to earlier this year. As far as, sorry, this is actually a typo, and I just noticed that as I'm recording this. Um, as far as minor balances go, we have seen some slight accumulation over the last week. And just a little side note, as I mentioned, uh, we're launching this indicator dashboard soon, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, we have this section written on global macro from Nick Batia. Uh, great, little, great little blurb here, so be sure to check that out, as well as Nick's newsletter. Uh, and then we also, of course, have our, like I mentioned, the, the Bitcoin-related equity section written by Blake Davis, 
Uh, he always goes really in depth, does an excellent job. Um, I always have fun reading whatever he, he sends me for the week. Um, so yeah, be sure to check that stuff out guys. Um, until next week, I'm going to go ahead and fix that typo that we just uh, noticed and uh, hope everybody has a good weekend. Have a good Halloween and, and we'll talk next week, guys. Take it easy.